All right, it's recording. Or yeah, yes, it's recording. All right, so we're gonna move on to the second section here. Um, this is regressions in R. So this is, if you think about this in terms of like levels, um, the intro stuff is like level one, where you learn how to, like what is R, how do I make things add, how do I use vectors, how do I read in data? Um, in this one, I'm gonna hopefully take it to like level two, where now we're actually like writing an R script to, to do analysis. So the first thing you have to do is, you know, you open up a blank R script. So instead of opening up a blank one, because I think you guys like the notes, I'll just start like down here on like line 52, right? So the first thing you're going to want to do is you got to read in any sort of libraries you, that you care about. You can read in the libraries halfway through the script. It's not a big deal, but just from an organization point of view, it looks so much nicer when they're up top instead of just scattered throughout and then randomly like, and then rewriting code later with that function and well, uh, with that library in mind, you know? So anyway, the first thing you're gonna do is read in some libraries. So let's say I want the scales library. This is like a something for plotting, which we'll talk about next week. But I read this in, and then let's say I wanna read in Stargazer. I read like this, this guy wants a citation, so it, it, it comes out like this. Now, if you've never used these packages before, if you try to run the library function, it won't work because you have to actually install the, the, the libraries to your machine. So before you can use library and for scales and stargazer, you have to do install that packages, scales. So this will install the, the, the package to your, um, to, to your computer. And you can do this for, for, for both of them. Then you're gonna have some loading stuff that's gonna come up and stuff like that. So make sure you guys, um, whenever you guys wanna use a package, you have to install it first. Wait, so you have to, so the install command, that's what actually installs it. The library command is all, like it's kind of calling on the yeah. package, is that how it works? Yeah, so, so you should think of it this way. Um, you need to download the software and then every time you want to use it, you have to ask R to like, Hey, I'm going to use the functions that's in scales or in stargazer. So, um, the first time you, you only have to install it one time in your entire life, unless you update your R or you delete the package for some reason, or you get a new computer. But once you install it, you never have to do it again. But then library is every time you want to use it, you have to use it. You have to do this. Now let's say. I have, um, for example, I have Lubridate. I have Lubridate on my computer, but I only need it for like one function. I don't actually need it all the time um, in this script and I don't wanna have to load it. So what I can do, if I just need a single use, I can just type in the package name, Lubridate, and then two colons, and then you'll see a bunch of the functions inside Lubridate will pop up. So suppose I wanted to convert a date a date to like numeric, right? 1990-01-01. This will generate like a date, right? So if you only need the package for like one thing, you might want to think about just doing this way to keep the clutter low and stuff like that. Okay. The second thing is you're going to want to um, set a working directory. So of course, um, you guys have like a million projects going on, I'm sure. So you separate it with folders on your Dropbox or your hard drive or whatever. So you wanna make it as easy as possible. You don't wanna have to have this huge long um, link every time you want a data set or something, or suppose you have multiple data sets or multiple files, you wanna write out the plot or something like this, right? You wanna make it easy. So for example, here I have a folder called Empirical Workshop 2021 on my desktop. It's got all sorts of stuff in here. Um, here's, a, here's a data file, right? So let me just um, copy one of these things. So on a PC, I can just click on one of the, on one of the files and then hit control C, so just copy it. And then I can paste. So when I paste, the whole string will come up. This might be different for, for people with Macs or Linux operating systems. 
but for for us for us pc users i should say you can use um you can just copy the file and paste it sometimes it doesn't work um usually you just have to close r and open up again but anyway i want to make this data folder my working directory so i want to delete this last piece right here i want to delete this file uh, colon slash 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 and i want to put this in quotes and this is going to be my file path so everything is going to live based on this so for example i'll just use that working directory and before i set my working directory i just want to show you that r is usually defaulting to your um, document folder so if i do get working directory it's in my documents but i want to change my working directory to desktop empirical workshop 2021 data so this is going to be where my my project lives. Sorry, can you show again how you got the file uh, path shown in the first like the first time you did? Did you just copy file? I went to here. I just clicked mm -hmm. on this full this file and hit Control C. Yeah. If it doesn't work, you might have to maybe click this. This is oh. kind of, this is kind of a pain because the slashes are going the wrong way. Like they're yeah going, yeah yeah. I already yeah. Figured. <laughs> so you can either. If you there's no good solution, but if you type in this, you have to either put double slashes for every slash, or uh, switch them the other way. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's it's just not the mm -hmm. best, but that's why I like copying and pasting the file. Somehow the copy paste file didn't work, so I, I'm, okay, go ahead. So you might have to you might you might have to type it occasionally. Um, I see. But usually that works for me at least. It does. So anyway. Now my working directory, especially you can see right here, now says users, Alex C, uh, desktop, empirical workshop 2021 data. So I have, we can see right here, here's my file explorer. I have this folder called bidding data, example.csv, nix, nix stats, and sharks. Um, I pretty much copy this from last empirical workshop. So we're only using like two of these files, but the example holds. So we have this, let's say I want to read in this Nix data set, right? I could just do read.csv, nix.csv. So it's all the that Nix data that we've been working with already. Instead, if you didn't set your working directory, you would have had to type all of this and then paste it here. And then every new file you want to you want to load in, like suppose now we want Nix stats. You can do this. But otherwise, you would have to have that whole file path in there. So when you're reading in data, you really got to make sure to either have the full file path, which I don't recommend, or you can have just set, you know, setting your working directory one time and then reading all your files. Now, let's say I want to read in data from bidding data. So if I open up this in my file explorer, I have bidders, right? So if I want to do, if I want that, all I can, all I have to do is read.csv bidding data slash bidders. .csv. And then all that, all that data gets read. Now let's say I, I'm working mostly within the bidding data. So I want to set my working directory there. So I do a bunch of stuff. Now I can set my working directory. Because I've already set my working directory to the uh, data folder, I can now just set my working directory one fo one folder deeper. So I can do it like this. So now you'll see that this updated too. And when you read all these files, do they like somehow show, like are they in working memory somewhere in R or like every time you open a new one, does the other one go away? Like, can you work with all of them simultaneously? Yes, but not the way I, I just did it. Because I read this, what R did, R is like super literal. Like it's it said, okay, I'll read the data and I'll print it here for you. And then it stops. It just printed it to the screen. It didn't save it because I didn't tell it to save it. But so, when you work with the columns or whatever, that's all you needed to do to then start working with it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So then okay. you can load in Nick's, Nick's stats and the bidding data all at once, and you can have all of them and Whenever you want to call a column from whatever data set you want, you just type in the name of the data set, dollar sign, whatever the column is. Okay, cool. Thanks. That's awesome. So now let's say I want to read in this Nix data again from this working directory. 
well, the next data is not in this working directory. So how would I do this? You would say read.csv. And instead of including like the next level and then the file, you have to two periods. This means go back one into, from the file system and then slash nix.csv. Whereas if I just said, give me Nick CSV, R is gonna say, I don't know what that means. I don't know where that file is. Another thing you can do is if you are navigating your, your files and you're not really sure what's in here, you can do list your files. And this will give you the three files that are in there. So if you don't wanna open the file explorer, you never have to. You can just do it all from here. I'm sure Stata has very similar functionality. Two, two questions. One is, uh, could you just reset the directory if I want to, like, as opposed to going back, would that work? Yeah, so if I want to set my working directory back to my desktop or my uh, documents, I would have to type in everything. Slash documents. Okay. And then, uh, have you worked with environmental variables in R or no? In like, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, yeah, so there's something called environmental variables, just set directories. So if you're working with different people, we can all send it straight to or directories, but don't worry about it. It's just another way of calling a directory, yeah. Yeah, so the way I usually do that, if I'm working with co-authors, this might be a little bit um, out of the scope, but I'll pretty much just ask uh, system.info or system. Something where you can get like the name of your computer. Maybe it's, yeah, and then user. So I'll do something like, and we haven't touched on if statements yet, but we will soon. So I'll say like, if this, equals Alex C, then I'll set my working directory like it's my computer. Um, that was good. So then if, but then if it's someone else, which again, we'll get to this, if it's uh, this equals um, Zach, Zach's computer or something, then I'll set the working directory like it's his computer. So if you wanted to work with multiple people collaboratively, and you have it on Dropbox and you're working on it, you save it and then Zach opens it and then he's working on it. You can put this at the very beginning of your code and it'll set the working directory to whatever your computer is. But that's a little bit out of the out of the scope for right now. Nice, that's super useful, thanks. Yeah, so we'll go over that uh, a little bit later, but, or the if statements at least. Okay, so we set our working directory. The next thing you want to do is sometimes R does this thing, even when you say don't save your environment, it saves it anyway. It just ultimately it's a good thing, but it's annoying when you don't want it to, right? So the thing I always like to put at the very top of my um, uh, R script. So this is the top of my R script. I always put this. So this just clears my workspace starting fresh. So when I do this, you can say goodbye to all that stuff. Right, so now I'm starting with clean memory. Um, something else you can do is this GC, it's called garbage collector. And it pretty much just like cleans out your RAM. So you're like totally fresh. I mean, this is like uh, just completely nuking your entire R, R um, environment from the past. So then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna read in these, these two data sets because I am working with these two data um these two data files and we want to start doing some analysis right so i have roster so i've set my working directory to the data folder i've destroyed everything and then i have roster and stats sorry can i ask another question so i saw that you put semicolon and then like in so it knows that that knows it's a separate line then mm -hmm. yeah so separator yeah. so it doesn't and then when you sometimes click like enter and it like um, starts in a new line, but um, like a little to the side or whatever, it still knows the same line. So how does it know? How, how, what's the best way to like make sure it knows? Like, 
does it need to stand to start with the same uh simple the same numbered symbol like every line you know like in for example in python you have to make sure everything is and even this data that everything is like on the same like if it's if statement has to be like right. um indented one losing the word but shifted shifted a certain number of spot like places does it what's the in r you can make your code as ugly as you want it can all be flush against the side um okay. i wouldn't recommend it because it's so unreadable um but when we start doing if statements and loops and stuff like that i space my code out religiously um just for readability purposes I don't comment my code, which is like all, which we should also talk about. You should always comment your code. So always add this little hashtag and say stuff like, uh, this deletes everything, you know? So adding comments to your code, I should have said this like the first thing um, is really important, for, especially if you have co-authors and you're um, helping other people write stuff. So always comment as much as you possibly can, especially if you, have a new thing that you just learned i always put the link to like the uh stack overflow or whatever um so, but otherwise if you don't put uh semicolon but you know like somehow r knows just via this the like the command like if then you have it knows that it's the same if command like it it has to go through to the end right you don't need to put in a certain place or put some kind of uh, punctuation to make it know that that's what it is. No, there, there's there's no, if you hit enter, it knows new line. Okay. Um, the semicolon is only if you wanna do multi-line things. So I just have this preference that could just be unique to me yeah. that I like these two, con like, I don't Together. like, yeah, it's like three or it's like four characters. I don't want it on its own line. I want it next to it. <laughs> it's just a preference. Okay, all right, cool, thanks. Okay, so now we have our roster and our stats data loaded in. Um, and then the first thing you always wanna do is whenever you read in data, you wanna kind of poke around, explore, make some plots, look at some tabulations, all, all sorts of stuff like this. So the first thing you wanna do is probably look at it. So here's our roster. This is what, we were, what we've been working with. And then here's our stats um, data set. So here's all like the ages and the games and points and rebounds and all sorts of cool stuff, right? So I want to talk about these few important functions, um, specifically these three. So table, aggregate, and match. Um, if you can learn these three and really like nail them down, that'll take you to level two, like I was talking about before. So what table does is it just counts the number of um unique or it finds a number of unique entries in a column and counts up how many each one of them occurs so if i was to do table uh nick's experience let's oh, roster now it'll say there's one per there's uh six people who are first year players there are two people that are 10 year players, two people that are two year players, two people that are three year players, and so on. So this is if you ever wanted to kind of just check what your data look like, this is a really good way to do it, just the table function. So if you want to do this, if you want to do age, or maybe like height in inches. Here's a tabulation of it, there's three guys that are 77 inches, right? So table super important. Now, if I wanted to tabulate two things to almost make it look like a matrix, I can do experience and maybe position. This here. Now I have a matrix that says, okay, for the centers, there's three of them. One of them has 10 years of experience. One of them has seven years and one of them is a rookie. For my power forwards, two of them have one year, one of them has two years, and so on, right? So this gives you just a nice um, count of each combination now. So when would you use this? One, to explore your data. If you want to know how many observations per state you have, how many observations per year you have, whatever. 
Or if you have something like, for example, crime data, and you want to count up the number of crimes per day, you would tabulate the number um, or the date column. So it would say, I have five observations from this day. I have 10 observations from this day. And then you can make like a time series like that. Um, another quick thing here is when you do this, and if you were to save it, oops, it saves as a table, not as a data frame. So if you want to make it a data frame, you have to say as that data frame. Let me put that in the code too. So now if I look at it, you can see all the combinations. I'm sorry to interrupt. How can we show their names? If I want to have the name and then the, the, the data next to it. The names of the players? Yeah. Um, you could click on like roster. Is that what you mean? No, no, I mean the table. How can I include a column then? Let's say for the names of the players, the name, like the states. Right, right, right. So that's that. So that was, I was just about to get to that. So oh, sorry. this sorry. makes it a data frame. No, no, that's good. That means you're, I'm anticipating you guys, which is good. So this table, like you were saying, doesn't have any like information, like what the heck is 110, right? So if you're just quickly checking, you want to do this. But if you want to say like, this is experience, experience, you can do like this. So now if I run this table, it'll have experience here. And if I want to do position, experience. If you want to do something where you have um, spaces in the name, I would just ignore, I would just try to like uh, not do that. But if you have to, the way to do that is you have to use these weird slashes. Um, they're above the tab key on a, on a PC. And then do a number of years. So you can see now X will be number of years. Okay, so that's a table function. So it's might seem small, but I, I can't tell you how often I use it. It's like probably the number one function I use. Next is aggregate. So we're economists, and if you're a macro person, what do you do besides aggregate? Right? So what aggregate does is you give it what you want to aggregate, what you want to aggregate by and how you want to aggregate. So if you want to do mean, sum, standard deviation, uh, length, um, some other wild function that you have, inverse hyperbolic sign, anything you want to do. So the aggregate function, um, here's some examples. If you want to aggregate the weight by position, and I want to find the average, this will give you um, group one and X. So again, like Ronnie was just saying, these are very uninformative titles. So instead, I can just put uh, position equals roster dollar sign POS or weight equals roster dollar sign weight. And then that'll give, that'll swap out X in group one. So aggregate, if you want to aggregate one variable by one other variable, simple as this. If you want to aggregate by, um, well, this one aggregates two variables by one variable meaning it will give you the average weight and height in inches. And again, I'm adding in the uh, names here. So WT equals roster weight. So here's the average weight and height by position. If you want to aggregate, that, go ahead. Sorry, did that change the data set or is that just like a summary of the aggregations? I'm aggregating and I'm saving it as a new, as a new object. So I have roster, roster exists by itself, and I have ag2. So for example, if I just copied this, now I have ag2. I've added a new object into my environment. So now I have these two objects that I can use. Now this next one is just a different way to do this. Instead of using, um, I made a list of two objects. I can just do like this. 
right? Just give the names of the columns. Why can I do that like this? Because data frames are already lists. I don't have to make a list of two columns. The data frame, calling the data frame this way is calling a list with two items. So this will give the same exact output. So depending on, I prefer this way, you might prefer this way. If we want to aggregate by, instead of aggregating by only one thing, we want to aggregate by two things. We want two dimensions, right? We had state and year or something like that. You can do two arguments in the, um, in the by here. Now, notice here that I'm doing position and X. So what is X? A really uninformative um, variable here, but it's that country variable where the person's from. So if we look at what that generates for us, is it only generates eight observations. So for example, BE only appears for point guard, right? So apparently there's no center born in, I think Belgium is BE. So um, what if we wanna know that there is nothing there, right? You have to use this drop equals false. Uh, by default, R will say, if I can't find any combination of center and Belgium, I'll drop it. But if there is one, or if there's not, and I say drop equals false, it'll just give me the NA. So here's the center from Belgium. Not applicable. There, there is no average for it. But at least you have the observation and you're not dropping it. So instead of having eight, you now have 25. And then I've only been using mean here, but you can do any function you want. You don't even have to um, use a predefined function. You can create your own function, which we'll talk about later. But you can do any everything you want right in here. OK. Any, any questions through table and aggregate? OK. So this next one I'm going to talk about is match. So what match does? is if you ever want to take two data sets and combine them, this is how you do it. So if you, if I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Excel, but index match is like the, uh, how you do this. This match function is exactly like that. Um, so if you know index match from Excel, this will be such an easy uh, uh, crossover. So the way match works, if you're familiar with Excel, you already know, but Otherwise, let's take uh, this example here. Okay, so this the first player in the in the roster data set is Kadeem Allen. The first person in the stats data set is Kevin Knox. So it's not Kadeem Allen. So if we just tried to steal the um, whatever variable we wanted from that data set and try to match it over, it wouldn't work. Right, because we would put Kevin Knox's stats next to Kadeem Allen. That doesn't make sense. So rather, what we want to do is we want to use this match function. And if we run it, what this is saying, this 16 is saying Kadeem Allen appears 16th in the stats data set. The second guy in the roster appears 20th. The third guy appears 13th. The fourth guy appears second, 18, 21. And then this guy doesn't appear at all in the data set, in the stats data set. So we can't match him. So what this is effectively doing is it's going to reshuffle the stats data set, like in like how are we doing order? It's going to reshuffle it so that it matches to the um, roster data set. And then you'll be able to map right over. So for example, if we want to know the number of games played, right? If I ask for stats, dollar sign G, 19. So Kadeem Allen better have played 19 games. So if we go to the stats one, we find Kadeem Allen, he's way down here, and he played 19 games. So it's reordering that vector within that data set to match the first data set. So you're always going to want to go. This is the one that you're matching to, and this is the one that you're stealing from. You're stealing data from this one. 
it's a it, it it might take a couple of tries but this is this is like super high powered um for example if you wanted to create three new variables you could just do it like this where you say okay i want to create games game started and points and i'm just going to use this match which is saved as m and i'm going to match it right over now one thing you'll notice is that this one guy was missing so let's look at him so he was the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh guy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So Tim Hardaway, we couldn't find him in the stats data set. And the reason for that is because he's Tim Hardaway Jr. So it technically did not match. So it wasn't going to try to um, force that match. So what we would have to do is we'd have to clean this string, either get rid of junior or add junior to the other way. And then it would match. So just I just wanted to show that like it wasn't like failing, it actually was not matching. So it has to be exact, uh, case and all. So any questions about table aggregate match? Do you use match yeah. to sorry? Do you use match to no, append okay, multiple years? Okay, so I think you're asking if what happens if there's like you have a panel data set of years and cities and you want to match based on that. Yeah, so if I have like a different data set for each year and I just right. want to stack one on top of the other. Okay, so if you want to just stack on top of each other, that's where our bind comes from. So that's, go back to the first one, introductions, um, R bind. That's when that's if you want to stack two data sets or two matrices, it's the same way. So if you had like, for example, if I R bind stats and stats, it's now going to be 35 plus 17 omitted rows. So it's whatever uh, 26 times two is 52. Do you know what I mean? So R bind is how you stack things. But if you wanted to match, so each column is a new year, or if you had a data set of like, Kevin Knox, age 19, Kevin Knox, age 18, age 20, age 21, and you want to know how many games he played at each, um, each age, instead of matching based on just player like this, you would have to instead, I don't have this, this data set, or the, the data set isn't constructed to do this, but you would use paste or paste zero. And I would say, roster player and roster age. And then this next one would be also paste zero stats var two, which was the player name and then stats age. So now you're, you're matching on two things instead of just one. Thank you. Chandler, did you have a question? Yeah, I just could you remind me what the comma so when you have that roster open bracket and then comma before calling that vector, what is the comma before? Um, this one right here. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay. So because roster is a data frame, there's two mm -hmm. dimensions, there's rows and columns. So I'm not trying to add new rows. I'm trying to add new columns. So I want all the rows. Okay, so that would be all the rows. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Everyone else with me? All right. So let's talk about econometrics <laughs> with five minutes to go. Uh, let's talk about econometrics. So uh, here's a data set called Quakes. It's built into R. So that's why I just did data Quakes. It'll be really easy for everyone to read it in because it's just already exists on your machine. And then I just asked R for, I'd use this function str, which gives you the structure of the data set. So this is a pretty good way to get like a summary of it. So it'll tell you it's a data frame, a thousand observations, five variables, has latitude, longitude, depth, mag, and stations. So this is a data set of a bunch of earthquakes, um, how many stations registered the earthquake, what the depth of the thing was, what the magnitude um, of the earthquake was, and then the, the, the position. So, 
you know, it's just a, a pretty simple toy data set. So the first thing you want to do is suppose we've already done all our tabulations, we've done all of our aggregations, we've done all of our matching up, right? We're all ready to start looking at the data as like uh, summary stats and start doing some tests on it. So the first thing you're going to want to do is make summary stats. Um, you want to find the average, you want to find the median, you want to find the, the standard deviation, right? So there's this library called Stargazer, and it makes really nice LaTeX tables. So for the, in this case, I just printed it as text, but if you, if you type in LaTeX here, it'll give you uh, the LaTeX output. So I just put the data set name just by itself. I said I want it as text, and the summary stats I want are number of observations, mean, and standard deviation. If you don't put summary stats, like what type you want, it'll give you n, mean, standard deviation, median, and then 25 and 75 percentiles. So you'll it'll it'll give you some some basic summary stats. And if you look at the output, it looks like this. In LaTeX, it looks beautiful. It kind of makes a table for you. Um, so this is really helpful. Uh, this is not the one I I I've been using this for most of my time at in grad school, but I've just recently switched over to this other one called model summary. Um, I have a little bit of a example here. It's a lot more complicated, but it makes the tables way better. Like this is the summary stats code, um, but you can pretty much just plug it in here. Like for example, you can just change this, change the labels, and then everything should be the same. Um, but yeah, uh, so Stargazer is a great start. Um, for summary stats and regression tables and stuff like this. So summary stats, great. How do you export those summary stats to like a Word doc or LaTeX or whatever? Yeah, if you want to do in, in LaTeX, just change this to LaTeX. And then you can just copy and paste it from the console because it'll print. Um, if you wanted to do um, a Word document, I think you do HTML and then you have Another argument here, uh, comma out equals and like uh, file dot doc like your word doc file. Um, there's a there's a little cheat sheet here or sorry here, and this guy is like goes through painstaking detail of all the stargazer stuff you can possibly do. I mean, it, the amount of work you put into this blog post is awesome. So anything you you want, this guy. Jake Russ, I don't, I don't know anything about him other than he loves Stargazer. So if you want to check it out. It's pretty cool. So, so this uh, package is all about like showing the results? Yes. So or, this is for okay. summary stats and regression output. That's like okay. where it excels. But do so, you run, do you use it to run the regressions or only no, for the results? Just to print it and make it look nice. I'll, I'll, I'll show what the default R looks like and then what, um, Stargazer does. So you made summary stats great. You have a, a outcome variable. It's a number of stations that registered the earthquake. And you want to do this by magnitude or something. You want to make a plot. So this is the default R plot. It looks terrible. It's got like the uh, vector names here. And it's got like, uh, it just looks awful, right? We'll talk way more next week about how to make this look awesome. Um, but for now, you can see that there's a positive relationship, right? So the correlation, 0.85, great. We're showing summary stats. We're like doing like undergrad econometric at this point. Um, so if you wanna run a regression, right? You wanna know how many stations registered the, um, the earthquake based on the magnitude. So if you run the regression, it's just gonna be this LM function. So linear model, your outcome variable goes here with a squiggle and then magnitude, so your, your outcome variables. And then you specify what data. So notice how I didn't put quakes dollar sign in front of either of these. The reason why I did that was because if you wanted to subset the data, you do it here in the, like you only want the earthquakes that happened after 2015 or something like that, if you had the, the year of it. You subset the data here instead of subsetting it for each individual um, vector. Hopefully that makes sense. So if you put quakes dollar sign, you'd have to subset it here and here instead of just doing it at the end. So we run the regression, we save it as reg one, and we look at the default R summary. That's just gonna look like this. 
So this is Wait, the what? good. Sorry, what's the dependent variable over there? Number of stations that registered the earthquake. Okay. So the first one is always independent, and then you can add as many as you want. After. Yes. So okay. for example, if you wanted to add another variable, mag plus depth. Um, the default is it always includes a constant. So you don't have to worry about that. If you want to, if you want no constant, like if you have like a fixed effects model, you want to get rid of the constant, you could just do minus one. So mag plus depth minus one. That would get rid of the constant. Um, but anyway, the summary looks like this, or maybe I will look at the summary of this one. Um, you have your estimate, your standard error, your t-value, your, your p your p value, all the classics, all the hits, you know what it's like. So um, great, but let's look at what how Stargazer makes a table because you can only look at one regression for each uh, summary call. So Stargazer lets you see them both next to each other and it makes it look really nice. Um, again, you can go to Jake Russ and check out what he's got on his uh, blog post, but you can customize this table like crazy. So you can change the names here. You can change what's displayed here. You can change which order it's in. You can change this name, um, table notes, all sorts of stuff. Um, well, Alex, if yep. you want to do uh, select certain years, let's say between this and that year, how do you do it here? Right. So if I wanted to run this regression, let me just do. All right. So let it load. So reg two looks like this, right? So this is just using the entire data set. But let's say I actually only wanted, um, here's the data. Let's say I only wanted to look at um, the ones where magnitude was above five. So I wanna do quakes, where quakes magnitude greater than five, and then make sure to keep all the columns. So doing it like this, you'll get a different regression. So this is just the regular regression call. If I do summary, it'll look more like we were talking about before. Thank you. So that's why I said, if you don't do this data, the, the other option, just do it like this. So it would be quakes depth, quakes mag, quakes stations. And then if you wanted to subset it, you'd have to put it here, here, and here. So it gets annoying. So instead of just doing it once like this, you'd have to do it three times. And if you have a ton of uh, controls, then it gets crazy, obviously. So this one, bad. All right, so Stargazer is great. You should use it. It looks nice. And Jake Russ has all the answers if you ever need a, have a question. Um, now you can do, I'm gonna move a little faster here. You can use uh, binary variables. So uh, to do like a, uh, like a logistic regression or a probit. So this is gonna be a logistic regression. You use GLM instead of LM. Um, and then this is just a binary variable as the outcome, same exact controls, whatever. And this is a Poisson regression. If we think that stations is actually a count variable where the mean is equal to the standard deviation, then or the variance, then we'll then we'll use that, and we can display all four of the regressions next to each other. And then here, what's nice about Stargazer, it tells you what the difference is. What's going on with family equals binomial over there? This is um, for logistic regressions, and this is for Poisson are you, regressions. Are you stating that the variable family is binomial, or are you? It's it's a it's a binomial process and the link is logit. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So there you go. If you want to run OLS or LPM or whatever, that's just regular LM. If you want to do logistic regression or Poisson, this is how you do it. Now, cool. Oh wait, I want to talk about one more thing. Uh, so for interaction terms, if you use a star it will give you A plus B and A plus B. So if I do like, um, this, it will give me mag depth and mag times depth. If I just want the interactive term, I don't want the other ones, I can just do this. 
and it'll only give me the direction. So when you're doing diff and diff, this is how you do it <laughs> uh, with the, those interactions. Okay. Finally, before we get to a break, there's this package called Fixest. Fixest. Um, it's I've just started using it, so um, it's kind of insane how great it is. There's another package called LFE, which does high dimensional fixed effects, but Fixist is just, I think it's superb. Um, it clusters your standard errors for you. It will, you, I mean, you could just do anything with it. So just as an example of the speed increases, um, this example, I ran some regressions. I, I generated a million observations, a bunch of random data, created some outcome variable, right? And I just ran the regressions. I just said, how long will this take my computer to run? So if I just do the two continuous variables for FELOLS, which is the fixest version versus LM, this one took 0.13, this one took 0.6. So this one's about five times slower. Um, but you know, 0.6 seconds, what are we talking about? It's a million observations. It really crushed it. So let's talk about what happens if we add in a fixed effect. So we had the first fixed effect. This one takes 0.4 seconds. If I add in the fixed effect here into my uh, LM function, it's gonna take 3.8 seconds. So it's like 10 times slower. Now this one, if I add in both fixed effects, took me 0.4 seconds. So really not anything of an increase. And then it, the, the LM version broke my computer. It just like quit. Our just froze and said uh, critical error. So. Um, you, I like physically could not do this regression, whereas um, the fixest regression ran so fast. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty amazing. And the problem with fixest though, is it doesn't work with Stargazer. I'm hoping the Stargazer guy will come up with a solution for it soon. Um, but that's why you need this crazy model summary uh, code to, to use fixest. But what's nice about this is if you use it and you kind of update all the things the way that you know that whatever matches your stuff, um, it, you could just copy and paste right into your paper. So, like for example, here's what the tables look like from the model summary. So this is the like summary stats version, and this is the regression output version. So you can add in all sorts of stuff and customize it completely. So I recommend it, but um, you know, it takes a little bit of a fixed cost. Any questions? You said, you said that it clusters the standard errors? Yep, it, cl it automatically oh. clusters it for you. At what level? Uh, whatever the like, first fixed effect is. So it'll cluster at FE1. Okay. So you got to put whatever you want clustered at, put it first. Okay. But there's, I mean, there's all sorts of really cool stuff you can do with this. You can you can do multiple estimations. So for example, um, let's see. The, the authors of the program, um, maybe it's actually here. Yeah. You can run multiple samples within one function call. You can run multiple outcome variables within one function call. You can do multiple specifications within one function call. So um, in one of the vignettes, not this one, obviously, they do 32 regressions with only one function call. So it's super, super fast. Um, it's really amazing. But anyway, we'll stop here uh, for maybe five, 10 minutes. Um, once everyone kind of comes back and, you know, settles back in, we'll, we'll, we'll get started.